Okay, and so you guys got, just so we understand and all the customers understand, you bought the brewery to essentially test different types of hops that, that Hop Union is coming out with or has questions about how they actually taste in beer. Yeah, we've got about 100 different varieties that we sell right now. And between all the people who have brewed, who work here at Hop Union, we've probably only brewed with about 20 or so you know, of them. So we've got a lot that no one really knows how they are in beer. So we're slowly starting to brew with some of those. Uh, but more, more recently, we've kind of been involved with the hop breeding program. Hop Union and Haas both have a shared uh, joint venture with uh, Select Botanicals and the hop breeding program. And so when they found out that we had a system here to brew with, they said, well, why don't we start giving you hops to brew with and, and uh, see how they come out. So HBC 342 is the first one that we've done here. Uh, and now Hop Union actually sells it. And... Um, and now we're messing with Australian and New Zealand varieties because we're looking at sourcing some of the new super aromatic hops that are coming out from down under. And Hop Union is going to be doing a big promotion this next crop year. And so we're just kind of doing some legwork on which ones we look okay, at because a lot of them are similar to American varieties. We don't want to step on our own ownership's toes and sell varieties that compete. We're more looking for complementary. So we're kind of weeding through... Uh, Australia sending us everything they got, so we're weeding through it and trying to figure out what we like. So, well, and one of the things we're excited about at More Beer, and I think our customers would be excited about as well, is the fact that uh, you actually will be making these beers with hops that you have, and hopefully the descriptions coming into the market when the hop comes into the market, a little bit better flavor kind of descriptions for so home brewers and brewers alike know what they're brewing with before they, they have to buy it and try it or, or find out information on the forums about what the hop tastes like. Absolutely. We're, uh, we're always uh, updating our variety book and uh, now we're looking for another revision. And so we are starting to take uh, feedback that we're getting from hops, either that we've sent out as samples for other breweries to brew with or from in-house. And uh, it's, I mean, this is, it's taken us a long time to get to where we're at right now. And so I, from this moment forward, things are gonna start move, moving a lot faster. Um, the first six months of brewing here was more designed on uh, developing Falconer's Flight and Zythos, which are two of our proprietary blends. Uh, and Seven Seas, Seven Seas didn't really take too much uh, brewing because it was Seven C hop varieties blended into one pellet so there wasn't really too much research but Zythos we did about 50 different blends and brewed three different batches before we finalized uh, the one that's in the market today so that kind of took a, a bulk of time um, I actually do sales as well so I travel a bunch so I haven't been here as much to brew as I'd like to but we are going to be phasing in some uh, other employees um, and people from outside the company to kind of help you know perpetuate this whole project. So if there's any so. breweries watching the video, you got Will in here selling the hops and making the beer to see how the hops taste like. <laughs> yeah. that, been a that's hands-on exper experience. <laughs> yeah. When you guys were coming up with the blends for the hops, did you guys have an idea in mind you were shooting for or is it kind of, did, were you ever surprised by you came up with a blend, just kind of throw it together to see what's what and you went, whoa, kind of surprised you. What was the approach? Well, um, Falkner's flight was uh, the idea of uh, my friend and uh, fellow colleague Jesse Umbarger. We both used to work at the Wild Duck Brewery where Glenn Falkner uh, was the brewer at before he tragically died. And so that was uh, that whole Falkner's flight was a tribute to Glenn. And it was kind of, we wanted to create a hop blend that was something that Glenn would use. He was very progressive, very... Uh, you know, over the top in his beer style. So we wanted to create a blend that was just over the top. So we basically took a bunch of the yummy varieties, as Jesse calls them, and just get them in certain proportions that just made everything stand out. Zythos was a little bit different. Zythos was kind of uh, made to help people who can't get a hold of IPA style hops in the marketplace right now. I mean, currently we're sold out of Amarillo, Simcoe, Citra, Centennial, pretty much what everyone wants. So Zythos was trying to find a way to make those flavors and aromas out of common varieties that are publicly traded. Uh, and the hard part was is trying to emulate some of those flavors and aromas, um, which you can't really do. So we, we did a lot of different blending on just what we thought would come out right. And after smelling them, 
we did come across a couple that were like, wow, these are really good. And as we all know, they change in the beer, so we wanted to brew with them to make sure that we were actually experiencing that same, you know, citrusy, tropical sure, flavor sure. Um, into the beer and not just what, what we now, smelled in the hops. Now, Zythos, I heard, was made in particular for Amarillo because it's one of the shortest in supplies, or was it just for IPA hops? In yeah, general? I mean, originally it kind of was focused around an Amarillo replacement, uh, but then as everything else, uh, I, I would say at first Scytho started as kind of an Amarillo replacement, but then as the other varieties became sold out in the marketplace, Scythos was more designed around just being an alternative uh, IPA style hop made from traditional varieties and not really trying to replace anything. If anything, we uh, we tell people to stretch out their current supply of stuff by supplementing it. Um, and so, I mean, you know, and there's some breweries that don't have any supply to supplement, so they use it 100%. But people have been using it to replace Centennial, Amarillo, Simcoe, um, and Citra, and having great results. We've actually had a lot of positive feedback. Um, so it's been a, it's been a cool, it was a cool project. I'm glad it. I'm glad it's had such success. Can you talk about the, the quantities of hops in those blends? Like Falconer's Flight is uh, around 12 hops or something like that? That's Falconer's cool. Flight this year, they, they both have around eight. eight. Right? Okay. And they both feature uh, experimental hop varieties. Um, not yet released. Not yet released, Very just cool. to kind of give complexity. Um, and Seven Seas as well has experimental. So it's seven of the sea hops and some experimentals. Um, you know, and I can't go into the actual details of what's in them. But uh, the seven C hops. Not even after a couple beers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, Falconer's Flight is made with uh, with trademark varieties as kind of like the super trademark top, and Zythos is made with uh, just publicly traded varieties to kind of help emulate some of those. You know, and I mean, and, and before three or four years ago, pretty much all the good IPAs in the marketplace were made with traditional varieties uh, with all the Simcoe, Citra, craze, people have kind of lost sight of that. So Zythos kind of helped bring people back to terms that you don't have to have Simcoe or Amarillo to make a great IPA. Yeah. And uh, now that people are brewing with Zythos, we're actually seeing that in the marketplace where people were like, wow, I didn't realize that I could make a great beer with just this. And, it's like, well, and we're excited. We're just about to release go. Zythos. So oh, cool. you'll, you'll, be, you'll be talking it up and it'll be available. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that was, that was my project. Basically, uh, I was given the task to come up with that blend and, oh, really? and design it all. So it was a um, very cool project for me. I, I learned a lot about smelling hops and uh, kind of evaluating you know, how they change in the beer a little bit. But that hop's pretty straightforward. It doesn't really change much. It smells like citrus and tropical fruit, and that's pretty much what you get in the beer, so. Do the hops get blended at the whole hop stage and then pelletized together, or do you blend after pelletizing? They get blended before pelleting. Uh, our pellet mills across the street, each uh, batch holds about 1,800 pounds. Um, so that's about nine bales. And so the blend sheet that we make will say, you know, we'll put 20% of this in and 20% of that. If some of the bales have to get cut down in varieties, they do that over in our evac station where they're already cutting up bales to put into uh, quarter bales and mini bales that we sell. Because uh, a 200 pound bale is just too big for anyone to deal with, unless you're Sierra Nevada, of course. <laughs> But uh, so they, they'll get blended in the top tank across the street and it basically just homogenizes all of them and then they fall into an auger screw below and that's what feeds the pellet mill. So as one's getting pelleted, the next round's getting blended. That way there's no like stop in production. And um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, you take a bunch of different varieties, combine them all together and then out spits a pellet that's kind of different than everything that you put in. And it's, uh, it changes a little bit. It's kind of it's sure, interesting. Sure. So. But uh, it's a blend. A little yeah. bit like blending beer or wine. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the parts don't equal the, the output. So, yeah, it was kind of interesting. You get aromas that you didn't even find in, in them before. It's just like they start complementing each other and you find new things. And uh, Zythos to me had a lot of pineapple aroma. And even in the beer, you end up getting a lot of pineapple. Um, at least I do here. But, you know, yeast influences that and, and other factors as well. But. Do you have a house yeast strain that you're using across the board, or you, know, you I, change? Every batch I've made here, I think, used a different yeast. Yeah. Um, just because I sometimes brew pretty impromptu. So it's like, oh, let's brew tomorrow. Oh, wait, we don't have any yeast. Well, I don't have time for a starter. So actually, that's kind of what happened today. I got yeast from a local brewery, but it sat in our cold room for about three weeks, and I looked at it last night. 
and put it under the microscope and it just didn't, I don't know, I didn't want to brew with it. So I went and bought packeted dry yeast, and uh, which I used for my last lager and I was really surprised with how well it worked. I mean, I'd always been a liquid yeast guy, but um, the liquid yeast I used for my lager last time kind of stopped on me after a couple days. So I got some dry yeast packets, pitched those, and it just like rocketed off. And, and uh, everyone that I've tasted the beer on is just like, Man, this is great, and it's like, yeah, it's dry yeast. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong in none of the process for, for both for wine and the beer side, even the distillation side. The dry yeast is absolutely fantastic. The only slag against it is that it's just, there's not a lot of choices. Yeah, that's true. That's pretty much it. You know? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I was looking in the cooler today, and it's like you got four to pick from, and two yeah. of them are lagers, and one's a wheat beer. So <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna make an ale, you got British or American. So I went with the, uh, I think it's uh, the US five. I think it's what the we're gonna Safio. use. Yeah. Safio, yeah. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. But in the past, I've used uh, uh, 1056 and I've used WLP01. I'm pretty much an American yeast guy. Sure. Um, clean I'd, flavors. Clean the flavor. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, if I'm making a stout, sometimes I'll use a British or an Irish yeast. Uh, but I, the last stout I made, uh, I used English ale yeast too, and it turned out great. So. I like experimenting with yeast, but in the same sense that sometimes it's easy just to stay with what works for you. It's yeah. kind of, I mean, that's kind of the commercial brewer. And you're a hop factory. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Where are we at in the, the brew? You need to do something? Yeah, I think it's probably about time to start. Um, to start. Uh, see, sometimes there's a difference in temperature here, and that's that whole, I probably should have stirred it longer because sometimes you get some grains stuck up in the and the unions here, so the temperature differs. Uh, but yeah, I think we're gonna do um, start a recirc and maybe mash out. And uh, do you know what time we started? I didn't set a timer. We did so. almost 40 minutes on the yeah. camera. Okay. So that's perfect. I had it running for maybe three, three, okay. three four minutes before we started doing anything, so about half an hour. So with the intention being uh, to showcase the hops and the difference in the different varieties in the beers, do you kind of have two or three stock recipes that you use and then switch out the hops in order to really be able to compare one to another in a beer? We did. With, with Falconer's White and Zythos, we used the same recipe. I think I brewed a total of five batches total with the same recipe and just changed the hops out. And then I would try to proportion them for the alpha difference. Luckily for Falconer's White and Zythos, the alpha is almost identical. So you can really sit down then with three or four pints and really just kind of say, the only real difference in this is that's the, the only X factor. And yeah. that's really where the reproducibility of the system comes into play too, because then you know that the beer is coming out the sure. same way each time, just with different hops. Yeah, and I think that this recipe that I'm doing today is going to be the new kind of sh uh, stock recipe, because before I was using too many grains, and so they were starting to kind of interfere with some of the hop flavor, and I think even a lot of that pineapple and uh, not that it was a bad aroma, I thought it was great, but I think a lot of that was influenced by the malt and the way the hops combine. So I'm kind of doing uh, a simpler grain bill, lower mash temperature, and trying to let the hops shine out more than, than muddling it up with a bunch of grain. Well, and that's something and that so, we tell home brewers all the time is make a consistent recipe so you can be checking out how you're doing uh, with a different yeast or different hops, or just sure. is, it, is it the same each time you're making the beer until you get it locked down and your process is locked down. Yeah, which is great. That's where these fermenters come in. Being able to set them with temperature control ensures that you're fermenting everything at the same temp. Because I know in the past, Esters. you know, juggling different fermentation, you know, you do the same recipe, you change up the hops, but then it gets really hot that day and you start fermenting it a lot higher. And then you're like, well, I can't compare these beers now. Well, you're getting a lot one of fermented at 80 at degrees point. and one fermented at 70 where it should. So, yeah, it's amazing how many esters yeast will spit out when they're stressed like that. And, um, I was actually listening to an interesting talk by uh, Stephen Paulsworth from Boulevard where they actually intentionally take the same beer, ferment it with a bunch of different yeast profile temperature ranges where they'll raise the temperature and lower the temperature and make six different beers out of the same beer, all with an extremely different uh, really? array of uh, ester profiles just from controlling fermentation temp. I thought it was fascinating. And, uh, but that's another research project probably way down the line. So right now, yeah, hops, but eventually we'll probably brew with every hop we have. And then, you know, it'll be interesting to start playing with different malts and stuff. Right now we kind of use this pretty generic malts. Uh, we have a partnership with Country Malt Group. So a lot of the grain we use is just 
great western. It comes from Vancouver on the other side of the mountain. So. Perfect. Great grain, but there's so many new grains out there now, and I like to experiment, so I've been wanting to try some different stuff. And it's see hard not to tweak, and you're yeah. still a little homebrew at heart, right? <laughs> yeah, so I always you, am. You yeah. to change a little bit. It's hard <laughs> not to. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing I've always loved about home brewing is being able to be creative, whereas the commercial aspect that I did for years was, you know, you've got a production schedule, you've got this to make, there's not really any, you know, every once in a while you might do a knockoff of something or, you know, make something cool, but for the most part you make the same stuff over and over and it does kind of get boring. So home brewing is great just to be like, I have total control and do what you want to and, you know, if I want to add more hops than my boss wants me to, I can. So. <laughs> Which I do. I like to put a lot of hops in these kettles. So, perfect. 